Is everybody having a good time? Woo! <laughs> awesome. So I'm going to speak about basically my past six years in the data science industry. Um, I first entered the industry in 2014. It was a very uh, chaotic time, lots of growth in the data science industry, so I thought it would be interesting at this point in my career to take a look back. So uh, you can find my Twitter up there. So um, I'm going to begin with a little bit about who I am, what I do. Um, make this a little bit bigger so I can see what I'm talking about. Uh, yes, here we go. I'm going to uh, speak a little bit more about why I'm going to give a, a retrospective on data science. I'm going to define what data science is, which that has definitely changed over the past six or so years. I'm going to talk about what's changed in the industry, what hasn't changed, and some conclusions. So who am I? I am currently a senior data scientist at a company called Envision. Um, I'll get a little bit more into what they do in a moment. I've, I've spent six wonderful, interesting years in the data science industry. I've mostly worked in startups from uh, the first company that I joined, which was a small startup of seven people, to the company I work at now, which is still a startup, uh, around 800 people. I've also mostly done Python. I think I've only done R once in the past six years, and that was only for like three weeks. So Python is definitely my, my tool of choice, and is why I'm here today. Um, and then mostly I've worked in New York City. Uh, however, now I work remotely, and I live in the great city of Philadelphia, which I think is where one of the sponsors, Linode, is based. I've seen their offices. And one thing I want to mention is that I have a huge passion for tech education, for educating others. Um, I've co-authored a book on machine learning. I've developed some interactive courses. I love to teach tutorials. These are all very exciting things for me. So huge passion. So just a little bit about my company. If you're not familiar with Envision, we are the digital product design platform powering the world's best user experiences. And yes, that is marketing copy directly from the website. Basically, it's a tool for designers and their collaborators and stakeholders to design uh, web-based apps. So um, you can do things like wireframe and brainstorm. You can actually build interactive prototypes without having to write code. And then you can hand off that design to your developer and actually get uh, assets and CSS and HTML. It's very cool. So what I do uh, in this very interesting company is I'm embedded with a couple of diff the different teams working on different products. And I help them understand how their users interact with the product. So I look at things like, how do particular users discover this product? Do they come to it organically? Are they invited to collaborate? Things like that. It's very exciting. So why I look back? Well, as I mentioned, much has changed in the past six years. Um, I think it can, be help it can be helpful at certain points in time to look back and try and understand where have we been, where are we now, where might we be going? Um, data science is kind of a new field in tech, and I use that sort of loosely because Obviously, the disciplines of machine learning and statistics and artificial intelligence have existed for many, many years beyond uh, the past six to 10 years. But within, within the past 10 years, they sort of coalesced into this new, new field in tech called data science. Things have evolved very quickly. Um, I also want, just want to mention, this is a very opinionated talk based on my own personal experiences. So I'm sure some of you also work in data science. Actually, uh, I would love to know, show of hands, how many people work with data in the data science industry, are data scientists? OK, cool. Um, you, know, you may have a completely different perspective than me. That's fine. This is just totally based on my own experiences. So before we get into what's changed and what's stay the same, let's talk about what data science actually is. Um, I think this term gets thrown around a lot. And uh, maybe in recent years has a less concrete meaning than it used to. So I think in order to understand the impact of the changes that have occurred in the industry, we need to just sort of define what this industry is and what it does. So if you think about it, data science is kind of a redundant term. If you think about the scientific process, any scientific process involves creating some sort of hypothesis around uh, what might happen in an experiment. And then you run that experiment, and you look at data, and you draw a conclusion about it. That's basically 
sort of what we do with data science, um, which is kind of interesting. So some of you may have seen this. This is the data science Venn diagram uh, originally created by Drew Conway uh, around 10 years ago. And there are three major components here. So we have hacking skills, and this refers to being able to manipulate data programmatically using whatever tools you might want to manipulate that data with. Um, there's math and stats knowledge. That's obviously very important if you're trying to take a more quantitative look at data, if you're trying to build a predictive model, if you're trying to build a clustering algorithm. And finally, substantive expertise which means being able to interpret the results as it pertains to a particular domain. So you build a model, you run an experiment, you analyze the data. What, is this, what does this mean for the particular data that you're analyzing? What does it mean for the particular industry your company is in? So uh, there's this great, this great post by Drew Conway about uh, six to 10 years ago, or I think seven to 10 years ago, where he's writing about sort of what data science is, and he, it's where he actually posted that version of the data science Venn diagram. And I pulled out this particular quote because I thought it was really interesting. Um, and it reads, as I have said before, I think the term data science is a bit of a misnomer, but I was very hopeful after this discussion he was uh, chatting with some other people about uh, what, you know, what this field might be, mostly because of the utter lack of agreement on what a curriculum on this subject would look like. And I put that in bold because I think that's very important. The difficulty in defining these skills is that the split between substance and methodology is ambiguous, and as such, it is unclear how to distinguish among hackers, statisticians, subject matter experts, their overlaps, and where data science fits. So again, this was early 2000s, and I think this was, or early, sorry, early 2010s, and I think this is a very interesting sort of prediction about the, indu the industry itself. This quote is still relevant. Data science is kind of hard to, hard to define, it's ambiguous. So the way that I define it, very simply, I think it's using data to drive business outcomes but also using stats and machine learning, whatever you know, theoretical tools you might have at your disposal to drive those business outcomes. But also, not just that, not just using the latest cool tool, but also st storytelling, telling a story about the data, getting the results, interpreting it, and then uh, explaining those results to your product manager stakeholder or to your VP of marketing who wants to know how to drive more click-through on their, on their emails but also counting things to drive outcomes, setting very basic metrics, very basic KPIs, understanding what success is in terms of a product or a strategy or a particular company. So sort of all of these things. Over the years, uh, the term data science has become diluted. You could argue that it was never very concrete to begin with. It was always sort of diluted, uh, hearkening back to Drew Conway's quote that I just read. These days, uh, if you look at data science job postings, they can, it can mean anything from business intelligence to artificial intelligence. It can mean anything from uh, you know, deep, intense models of how a robot might work to creating a dashboard for your stakeholders. There are pros and cons of this. Um, I think one of the biggest pros is over the past six years that I've been in the industry, there's been a growth of realization of how important data is. How important data is in making decisions at your company, making decisions about your product, making decisions about how your users, how your users might feel. Um, especially uh, when it comes to things like protecting data, making sure your data is very secure, or making sure you can't easily identify individual users from your data. Uh, you know, validating the data, making sure your data is accurate. The cons are that uh, this translates into a wild variety in day-to-day -day jobs between companies. I have a number of friends in the industry. We all do kind of similar things, but also a lot of the time wildly different things. So, so, now, that, so now that we've defined this, what has changed? So uh, one of the biggest things that has changed is hiring for data science. And again, this is just my perspective, uh, being based in the United States. In the beginning, there were a plethora of jobs. They were just sort of handing them out left and right, not like real, actually handing them out. You obviously had to interview. But in 2014, um, data science was blowing up in a way that every company wanted to hire a data scientist. Uh, there was a lot of hype surrounding the data science industry. It was very popular. 
Job, job requirements were maybe a little bit hazy at the time. Sure, we need some Python, we need some machine learning. Beyond that, mm, not too sure. Uh, the very first job that I worked at, not only did I analyze data, I also did a lot of what we might call today data engineering tasks. I built pipelines. I made sure data could get from our Postgres database to uh, the users who wanted to see it on the front end. And arguably, uh, a lot of the hiring that was done around the time may have been unnecessary. And unnecessary in terms of saying, okay, everyone's hiring a data scientist, I wanna hire one too. This is sort of the, the situation I found myself in at, my, at the very first job I ever had in New York. I joined this very tiny seven person startup, I got there day one, and I was like, okay, what problems are we trying to solve? And they were like, we don't know. So <laughs> kind of sat around for a couple weeks trying to figure that out. Um, it was my first job out of grad school, so I wasn't mature enough in my career at that point to understand that, um, you know, uh, how, to, how to take initiative, how to figure out what problems to actually be solving. So it's a very uh, interesting experience. So sort of in the middle, um, what, what we might think of is like 2015-ish, uh, um, starting around then. There's some slowdown in the market, but uh, data science is still pretty hyped, especially because of big data. And we'll get to big data later. I have a bone to pick with big data. Um, but we also started seeing a, a rise in data engineering and data analyst ro roles, right? So we've hired all these data scientists, they need all these pipelines to get the data, they need things transformed. So we started seeing a lot more hiring of data engineering and engineering type roles to support data functions, as well as analyst ro roles, specifically data analysts, to operate in SQL and to answer ad hoc and more, uh, less complex questions. There also, there's also some stabilization of job requirements. Started seeing more things like ability to communicate with non-technical stakeholders, which is maybe the most important aspect of being a data scientist. Um, and as for today, hiring is so different today than uh, six years ago. There are a lot of entry-level folks, and there's far less availability of entry-level jobs. Uh, most data science roles are not solving extremely complex problems. That probably has remained the same. Um, and also companies tend to be more thoughtful about hiring data people. I think that's the most important and beneficial thing that has happened to the, the hiring industry is that companies aren't just hiring data scientists and data engineers and machine learning engineers and whatever because it's the hot thing to do. They're doing it because they realize they have a genuine need for this type of role at their company and they have a good understanding of how that role fits in. So this isn't always true. You still run into situations, especially in early stage startups where they're like, we need a data person, but maybe you're not in the right place for that. You don't have enough data, you don't have enough users. So another thing that has happened is there's more specialization of, of roles within the industry. So in the beginning, there was the data scientist. And as I mentioned, I did things like uh, you know, building data pipelines. Uh, I did some JavaScript front end stuff to make the visualizations work. I obviously did a lot of Python and machine learning type stuff. Um, so, so in the beginning, it was a little bit more, you wore many hats. Um, and the same is probably still true for a lot of smaller startups. Uh, but after, after time passed, we realized we needed the, the need for data science infrastructure. Infra infrastructure supporting the data scientist's ability to do their job, which is very important. Building pipelines, implementing those models in production, running ad hoc queries, and maintaining the data infrastructure. So this goes far beyond just the normal database administrator role that, you know, DBA that has existed for a while. Um, and it's also speaking to like maintaining the quality of the data, so uh, sort of all these all these needs started rising up, and so now we have many different roles that fit under the umbrella of data. So data engineer, obviously, uh, a number of my friends are machine learning engineers, and my company we have business intelligence en engineers. We see data analysts, decision scientists, data science engineers. I actually saw that. Uh, job posting ones, data science engineer. I was like, how is this different from either a data scientist or a machine learning engineer? I don't know. And product scientists. And there's more. There's more. This is just like a very cursory Google search of, you know, data industry jobs and all these came up. 
<laughs> so there are many paths. Sometimes they lead to the same destination. You know, arguably, if you you know combine a machine learning engineer with a data scientist, you get a data science engineer. I don't know. So different roles. This this all is saying that different roles within the same company can focus on different things. Uh, it's more um, you know compartmentalizing the data science workflow. So if you're a data scientist, you don't have to worry about building the pipelines, maintaining the infrastructure. You can focus on analyzing data. Um, and let's see. One of the most important things, too, is that there's been sort of a specialization in terms of what companies are actually wanting their data scientists to do. So things like building data products for customers, internal analytics for teams, that's mostly what I do in my job. I, I do internal analysis on our different products and how users use them in order to help the product managers with their product roadmap. Um, and also building production-ready machine learning models, which is everyone's dream. So these days, and I think this has maybe always been true, a smaller amount of jobs are research oriented. Um, you know, small, a small amount of jobs are focused on developing new machine learning algorithms, developing new artificial intelligence methods, but most data science jobs are applied rather than theoretical. So you're more likely to be building a dashboard than coming up with some new fancy algorithm. So a final note on hiring, there are a lot more remote jobs now. My company is totally distributed. There is no headquarters anywhere. I worked remotely for a number of years now, and I love it. It's the best thing ever. It lets me come to places like this beautiful city and hang out and speak here. Uh, there are many, many remote and remote-friendly companies, and this is a general industry trend. The, the amount of remote jobs has definitely risen in the past six years. There aren't as many remote data science jobs as remote software engineering jobs, but they still exist. They're still out there. Um, and I'm always interested in hearing about you know, who's making the transition to remote, what new companies are going fully remote, and all of that. So another interesting thing that has changed is the way we learn data science. So uh, six years ago, I graduated with a master's degree from the University of Michigan. And my degree was a master of science in information, which sounds extremely vague, and I agree it is. My specialization was in something called information analysis and retrieval, which was sort of like data science, but not really. So in grad school, I took a class called Data Analysis in Python, where we manipulated data with raw Python data structures, so no pandas. Um, I took an information retrieval class where one of the projects I had to build a naive Bayes classifier, and I did that from scratch without scikit-learn. Yeah, good times. Um, <laughs> oops. In those days, uh, there weren't really any college programs offering data science degrees. There were a few, if any, boot camps offering data science programs. It was very early days for Coursera, Code Academy, um, and other, you know, other open source learning platforms. Now, there is a plethora of free open source material. That's not to say that all of it is good. Uh, there's just to say there's a lot of it. So there's also boot camps galore and university programs galore. And because of all of the university programs and boot camps, that's sort of why we have a lot more entry-level folks than entry-level jobs available. We're sort of uh, facing a supply and demand issue there. Um, we, we, we are now seeing the monetization of once free resources like Coursera. I remember before you didn't have to pay to take a Coursera class. That was, that was cool, but like all internet companies, we must monetize. Um, we've also seen a, a, an expansion in conferences, spe specifically in, in what, what I want to call general data science conferences. So Pi Data is a conference that has been around for a very long time, but I'm speaking of conferences like Open Data, what's it called? Open Source Data Science Conference, which takes place uh, several times a year. I think that's still happening. That's like a, a new conference that, is, that has grown in the past few years. Or like, uh, data Day Texas, Data Day Seattle. There's been a lot more opportunities for data, science, data scientists to go and speak at very specific data science conferences. I'd also say that documentation has improved. Um, documentation for the tools that we like to use has gotten better over time, it's gotten more thorough, uh, it's gotten more meaningful, and it's gotten more beginner friendly. I think these are all really good things. 
So another thing that has evolved, tooling for data science is much different. So uh, specifically, I want to talk about data at scale for a moment. So the second company that I worked at produced a lot of data on a monthly basis, probably produced around seven terabytes monthly, uh, which is what I would actually say is actually big data. Um, so in the beginning, there was Hadoop, and then along came Spark with all of its promises. So I want to talk about Spark specifically because it's had a pretty meaningful impact in my career. Um, and I first started working with Spark around 2015. So uh, if we think about Hadoop for a second, there's very popular, or there was, a very, well, it still exists, but very popular Python library called MRJob, which is for writing MapReduce, which you can run on Hadoop. So, uh, here is a lot of code that basically all it does is count URLs from a particular domain. And this is using MRJob, and this is running it on Hadoop. So in 2015, I wrote this to count some URLs. The next thing I did was do the same thing using PySpark. As you can see, this is much less code. It's also very readable. Uh, it was also faster. At the time, you know, this is my very first experience working with data at scale. It was amazing. It was like, oh, the sheer power of it. I can, I can count, you know, terabytes and terabytes of data in a matter of seconds. However, uh, a couple slides ago, I said the phrase, along came Spark with its promises. So uh, in 2015, PySpark was not that great. So I have a tweet here on this slide that says, hey, people doing PySpark, have you ever seen an error that says, type error, Java package object is not callable, having trouble debugging? And my good friend Andrew Musselman says, use the Scala API, which I then started doing because this was an undebuggable error. This was some error way deep down in the Spark source code that was being very poorly translated. Uh, and I just couldn't solve it. So. Um, that was 2015. Uh, working with data at scale is largely much easier now than it was five years ago. So I haven't used PySpark a ton since those early days, uh, but it does seem like it's significantly better now. Um, other things are easier now as well. Um, deep learning libraries are much more usable. Packaging environments is easier with tools like Docker. And uh, you know, uh, at the time I was running Spark on AWS, there's been a lot of other machine learning and data science type tooling arising on other cloud platforms like Google Cloud Platform and Microsoft Azure. I only have AWS experience, so that's sort of where this, this talk is going. Um, I wanna talk about AWS just for a moment. So in the early days, AWS did not officially support Spark. So in 2015, when I wanted to run Spark on an EMR cluster, me and the poor DevOps guy sat down and we figured out how to hack together a config file for the cluster to actually make it install Spark and run it. Today, uh, that is not the case, it comes pre-build, if you spin up an EMR cluster, you can install Spark on it from the user interface. You don't have to um, hack together some sort of config file. Um, so AWS has come a long way in terms of uh, supporting these open source cloud tools. So uh, this includes cre uh, having and, and supporting tools like Zeppelin and SageMaker. So Zeppelin is basically a Jupyter notebook that you can run on top of Spark. Um, you can run Python and PySpark in it. You can run SQL, you can use Scala. It runs on top of EMR. It's really great for doing exploratory data analysis on large amounts of data. Similarly, and this is a tool that I just became acquainted with recently, uh, SageMaker, which is also uh, Jupyter Notebooks running on AWS. Uh, they run on top of EC2, but you don't have to even worry about uh, touching EC2 or spinning up an EC2 cluster. SageMaker just does it for you. I swear this is not a sponsored AWS talk or anything. I'm just really psyched about this tool. Um, it's really easy to use. It uses uh, S3 as its data source. And it looks really promising. Some other tooling changes. Um, as we all know, we have moved to Python 3, hopefully. Uh, most scientific Python libraries have moved over. Um, it was slow going for some of them, but I think we're mostly all there now. 
There's a lot more data pipelining tools like DBT, which ease data transformation. So DBT stands for data build tool. This is actually something we use uh, at my company. We basically use it as sort of a transform layer within the database itself to extract raw data, uh, maybe uh, clean it, format it, write it back to the database, and then it's easier to query and work with. Uh, and now R can be used with many tools. I don't know if we like R or not. I'm whatever, R is fine. Um, but you can run R on Spark. I don't know that we would recommend that, uh, but it might be good. And then you can also use R within dashboarding tools like Mode Analytics. And speaking of dashboarding tools, there's been a definite rise in the amount of dashboarding tools out there in the past six years. So. Uh, these are more self-serve tools for ad hoc needs, for um, you know, surfacing interesting metrics that your stakeholders might care about. Tools like Looker, Mode, we use Mode Analytics at my company, Periscope, Amplitude, we also have Amplitude at my company. Um, they uh, integrate with various data sources from you know, Postgres, Redshift, MySQL, whatever you want. And with some of them, with Mode, and I think also Periscope, you can actually run Python and R within notebooks in the dashboards and then visualize those uh, plots on the dashboard, which is pretty cool. And this is a big component of my current job, servicing metrics, defining what success looks like. Okay, so now that we've talked about what's different, what has stayed mostly the same? I say mostly because nothing just stays the same forever and always. Okay, so here's where I wanna talk about big data for, for a moment. Um, something that has stayed the same is what I like to call the data science hype machine. So the data science industry, well, the tech industry in general really likes to hype things up, but in particular, for some reason, the data science industry really likes to hype things up. So the hype has, has changed over time, but there's always hype at any given time. Um, during my time in the industry, the very first thing that was hyped was data science itself. People were hiring data scientists for no reasons other than everyone else was. Uh, big data. Big data was, was very hyped for a, while, for a while, especially with the rise of tools like Spark. Um, I prefer the phrase data at scale because people look at, at you know, maybe gigabytes of data and say, this is big data. I strongly disagree with that. I think unless you're working with terabytes with data that you literally cannot fit on your machine, that you couldn't even fit on maybe like four or five machines, you're not necessarily working with big data. And as such, you probably don't need a big data tool if you're not actually working with big data. <laughs> rant, rant over. Um, Deep learning definitely went through a hype phase. I think this has actually resulted in deep learning tools being really usable now. Uh, and then of course, AI is all the rage. The robots are coming to get us, except Siri can never understand when I'm asking her what the temperature is, so we'll see about that. Okay, so uh, generally speaking, the skills that companies are looking for when they're hiring data scientists have stayed the same, the basic skills. So if you look at any job posting, you'll, you'll see something like, uh, you know, we want people who know Python or R, we want people who know SQL, we want basic knowledge, stats and machine learning, um, and this will all change depending on the job, obviously. Um, so I put uh, data intuition on here, and uh, what, what this sort of means to me is understanding how to think through a set of data. So beyond just, I'm going to throw 18 different machine learning models at my data set and see what happens, and then choose the best one, and then not be able to explain the results to my stakeholders, because I just took 18 models I've never heard of and threw them at my data set. Um, no, this is actually understanding the data that you're working with, you've done a thorough investigation of it, you've asked it a lot of questions, and then deciding what you're going to do with it. So ability to communicate may be the most important thing when it comes to the data science field. Uh, and this is, there's a few reasons for this. Um, the first is that, uh, Generally speaking, data science teams are very small. They're very small compared to the number of engineers, the number of product people. So uh, 
you know, most of the jobs I've had, the first job I had, I was the only data scientist. The second, I was the only one for a while, and then we got another one. The third, I was the third for a while, and now actually I'm on a team of like 20 people, which is crazy to me. Um, but it's a small team, so generally speaking, the people that you're going to be working with are people who aren't on your team and don't necessarily understand machine learning or don't understand what a p-value is, um, which may seem very you know, easy and intuitive to you, but unless you are able to communicate with your non-technical stakeholders or your non-data science stakeholders in a meaningful, non-jargony way, uh, you're going to risk alienating them, and then people are like, oh, data science is in the corner, what are they working on? We don't know. Do we even need them here? That's not a good position to be in. So that's why I think uh, communication is, is maybe the most important skill a data scientist can have. Uh, and finally, the ability to be independent. So the ability to take an ill-defined problem and create a whole project out of it. You know, from taking, you know, why are our users churning, which is a fairly ill-defined question, and then actually take that data, dig in, figure it out. That's also very important. So going back to uh, Python, I want to highlight Python since we are at a Python conference. These are uh, lines from a variety of job postings I found in a very short period of time earlier in the week and just took screenshots of them. Good understanding, Python, strong proficiency in Python. So you know, there's some R up here, there's a job posting with Scala some SQL, but mostly Python. Python is still the tool of choice for data scientists, which is awesome. Uh, Scikit-learn is still the machine learning gold standard. We have uh, libraries like NLTK and Spacey for NLP. We have PyTorch for deep learning. We have pandas for pretty much everything. And side note, I love pandas. Pandas is my all-time favorite Python library. Shout out to Wes McKinney, who is keynoting tomorrow. Thank you so much. Um, and Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so Python, obviously very important. Uh, we've also seen uh, a lot of Python conferences over the years dedicated to scientific Python. So there's SciPy conference, which happens in Austin, Texas every year. In the summer, it's very hot. And also PyData, which happens around the world in many cities. Um, and also, if you look at the schedule for PyCon Columbia, there's a lot of data science talks tomorrow and on Sunday. Uh, there's workshops on Sunday, but yeah. So that's awesome. Python. So going back to Jupyter for a moment, uh, if you remember the cloud tools I talked about earlier, SageMaker and Zeppelin, these are both basically Jupyter Notebooks translated to the cloud. So maybe you don't know what a Jupyter Notebook is. A Jupyter Notebook is an open source web application that allows you to create and share documents that contain live code, equations, visualizations, and narrative text. So it's an interactive exploration of data. Um, you know, you can use it to clean data, you can use it to prototype a model. Um, it may be the most important tool for data scientists. It's become a key component of the data science workflow. I use it for exploratory data analysis, for figuring out basic things about my data. I use it for prototyping machine learning models, going through the rigorous process of understanding, is this, you know, is this the right model, validating the model, um, you know, doing feature selection and engineering. It's great. More things about Python, major tools have Python APIs, which is great. We already talked about Spark, but here's a list of other tools. Uh, Neo4j is a graph database. Um, TensorFlow is a popular neural network library. Elasticsearch is a very fast search engine framework. Database tools like dbt, which I already talked about. Airflow, which is sort of similar. And Snowflake, which is a database. Um, message queuing like NSQ, and so on. So. Uh, you know, this isn't really anything new. Major tools have kind of always had, pretty much always had Python APIs, and if not, they've, they've caught up. Okay, and now on to maybe some of my favorite slides. Data in the wild is still messy, and that's never going to change. So any data you get that's generated from systems, users, whatever, it's going to be maybe terrible to work with. So I've encountered data issues of various uh, complexity over the years at every single company I've ever worked with. I've had to deal with super messy, imperfect, incorrect, inconsistent data. So data issues like 
Data that was manually collected is inconsistent across sources for the same data point. So this was at the very first startup I worked at. Uh, it was a commercial real estate startup, and we had a bunch of data on different buildings around New York City. And um, these, uh, the, the data that we collected would have data points like square footage. And square footage is something that would be manually entered on a variety of PDFs. And sometimes for the same building, we would have three different square footage measurements. And I'm not talking about like, oh, this document says it's 1,000, this document says it's 10,000. I'm talking like, this document says it's 1,000, this document says it's 1,100, which is very close. Yeah, human entered data, good times. Um, ah, internet cookies. So if you've ever worked at a company where you, you don't actually have users log into an app to use your product, you may consider using the internet cookie as a way to identify an individual user. Uh, this is what we did at the second company that I worked at. And the only problem here, which is the biggest problem, is that cookies refresh. They go away after a while. So how do you map cookies to each other? You don't. There have been a lot of companies in this space trying to solve that problem, and I don't really think anyone has solved it. Useless and or incomplete data from third-party APIs. Ah, uh, yes. So at the third company I worked at, um, I did a lot of analysis of how, well, it was a digital media company, uh, Mashable, and uh, I did a lot of analysis in terms of understanding how uh, posting on different social media platforms would impact uh, our engagement with our content. So the Facebook API is garbage, and I will stand by that. Um, and the Google Analytics API is also not much better. So useless, incomplete data from third-party tools. Okay, now I'm going to talk about a few things from my current company. Wrong data is being sent through client-side analytics. So we had a situation where, uh, with one of the teams that I work with, you know, we want to understand a particular thing about the product. We want to see, you know, users, they're performing one action and then they're taking another action. Well, one of the actions um, took a look at it and realized that we were sending user IDs wrongly somehow, which I still don't even know how that happened because you authenticate into the app and everyone's logged in and it's great, but it was wrong and made it very difficult to do any sort of analysis with that. Missing client-side analytics. When I first got to Envision and I was assigned to work with a couple of these teams, uh, we were like, okay, we want to measure how many users are using comments. Oh. We don't have any uh, instrumentation for tracking comments. So I guess we just can't measure that. Great. OK, let's get that implemented. Discrepancies between two dashboarding tools reading from the same data source. Earlier I mentioned we use both mode analytics and amplitude, and this is not a situation I ever recommend. <laughs> uh, for some reason, these tools reading from the same data source produce uh, two different results. <sighs> Writing JSON blobs to columns in Redshift. This is a real scenario. <laughs> it's not a pretty one. Um, we had an instance of, uh, let's see, I think this was earlier last year, they were building out uh, a new API for one of our services and uh, they were sending the data that the client, well, that was generated on the client side to uh, the database in Redshift in a single column in a blob of JSON. Um, it is not fun to parse JSON in SQL. I don't recommend it. And I could go on, but this slide is full and you get the idea. Oh, goodness, okay. Apparently if I laugh, it's gonna go boom. Okay, so some takeaways. The industry moves quickly and this can be overwhelming, um, especially if you're newer to it. Uh, but there is a lot of knowledge sharing going on. People are trying to more broadly share the work that we're, do that we're doing, um, the problems they're solving uh, at conferences, online, that's a good thing. Um, there's been a significant move toward including data science workflow uh, in tools. So things like Zeppelin and SageMaker, things like incorporating Jupyter Notebooks into tools, uh, which, is, which is great. Um, working with data is challenging, but it's also rewarding. That's why I do it. That's why I'm here. And uh, yeah, Python. Python's great. 
I think I have five minutes left, is that right? Yeah, great, okay. So where will we be in another six years? Wouldn't it be great if I knew for a fact? Uh, I'm hoping that in six years, there will be even more sophistication in tooling for uh, analyzing data at scale, for deep learning, for reinforcement learning, for all of these really cool tools that are becoming more popular. I'm also hoping that uh, job requirements will evolve and stabilize. I don't think you need to have a PhD to be a data scientist. I don't have a PhD, so I'm biased, obviously, saying that. But I have noticed over the past six years, there, there have been less and less job postings that require PhD for that role. Um, I mentioned before also that uh, a lot of data science work isn't super duper complicated. So that's definitely related. Um, I'm hoping also that like when we think about what a data scientist does every day, it's sort of uh, becomes a little bit more standardized than the wildly different roles that we're seeing today. Um, I'm hoping that we also have more remote, more remote jobs. Uh, we all have computers, we have video chat, we have Slack, we have many tools to communicate asynchronously and to communicate when we're not in the same place. I don't think you necessarily need to be in, in the office at the same time. It is nice to see people in person, but it's also nice to uh, not have to leave my house when it's snowing outside. Um, still Python, I hope. I really hope that in six years we are still super into using Python for scientific analysis, and I really think we will be. And there will still be messy data. There will always be messy data. If you want to be a data scientist, it is a more difficult time to break into the industry. Um, like I said before, there are not very many entry-level jobs. But there are a lot of entry-level folks, uh, but it's not impossible. There's a lot of material out there online for learning. Um, and I would also say that engineering skills are important and definitely a differentiator. Uh, if you know how to code and write code well, that's going to put you ahead of the pack. And communication is still key. Again, that's maybe the most important skill for being a data scientist, is being able to communicate, being able to communicate these wildly complicated results you have to your stakeholders. And please come talk to me. I'm gonna be here the whole conference. Um, please come talk to me about data science, Python, the industry, your thoughts on what's changed if you've been in the industry a while, anything you want. Um, yeah. And remember, keep calm and code Python. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias.